Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Bridget Terry Long, and I am very proud to be the Dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Welcome to Education Now, the challenges of reopening. Our summer webinar series on, with insights on teaching, learning, leading, and really just living at, during this time of COVID-19. This series runs through September 2nd, and all of the episodes are available on YouTube and Facebook. And I welcome you to submit your questions during this webinar um, and the, using the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you need closed captioning, you can also find access there. Uh, for this very special episode, I am so pleased and delighted to welcome Dr. Ashish Jha. Uh, he is director of the Harvard Global Health Institute, a practicing general internist, um, and a professor at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School. Ashish is on the front lines of the COVID-19 response, leading national analysis of key issues around the pandemic and advising policymakers and elected officials at the state and federal levels. He is also about to become uh, the Dean of the Brown University School of Public Health in September. Uh, so again, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ashish Jha. Welcome. Thank you, Bridget. Thanks for having me on. So it is great that you could join us um, we have crossed paths um, many times, um, and I think both as professionals, but also as parents, I think are going to yep. bring some new perspective um, to this issue. So the title of our session, session today is, Can We Actually Reopen Schools Safely? Um, the hope is that we're going to provide some insight about how we might approach this, because there aren't easy answers to this question. Um, and I know as a leader of a school, as an educator and parent myself, um, like so many of you who are in the audience just grappling with how do we make decisions along this line, these lines. Um, now, I do want to take note. Um, I know many districts out there have already made decisions to be online this fall, but this conversation isn't just about this fall. The goal is to explore issues related to when and how we can safely reopen schools, um, our buildings, our campuses, K-12, and higher ed. So Ashish, to, to kick it off to you, uh, let me ask you the, the basic question, can we reopen schools safely? And I know I want to start off right off the bat acknowledging the answer is it, it depends. It depends on your child, on your family, on your school, um, but also what's going on in your community. So let's start at the community level. How do you think about this differently if you're Massachusetts versus your Florida? Yeah. Well, again, uh, thank you for having me on it. And this is the big question and it's the big policy question. It's what I've been talking to Congress about. And it's what I've been talking to my kids about uh, at the dinner table. And, uh, and all of them, I mean, in some ways are, are deeply focused on this because the value of getting kids back to school uh, is enormous. And I think we need to understand that if we fail to get kids back to school, uh, that will have very substantial costs. It will have effects directly on kids, on parents, on issues of equity. I just want to put, remind myself of that, because to me, this is not a pure public health question or not narrowly constructed a public health question. It is that broader question of what is good for kids, what's good for parents, what's good for um, society. That said, there is a very large public health angle here. And if to go to your question about Florida versus Massachusetts, the very simplistic answer is probably not in Florida, almost surely not in Florida, probably in Massachusetts. But let's just tease that apart a little bit. Yeah. The single biggest determinant of whether you can open up schools safely and keep them open. So, you know, a lot of politicians are like, just, just open the schools. I'm like, sure. And you'll be closed in four weeks. And then you won't be able to open them again for many, many months and people will have gotten sick and it'll be a disaster. So we have to be thoughtful. And the thoughtful approach, the single biggest determinant of opening schools and keeping them safely open is the amount of community transmission. And there is no magical number. There's no number that says above this, you cannot do it, below this, you can. Because even at low numbers, there is risk. It's not zero. But we know there's risk of keeping kids at home. So that's not zero. California has tended to use a, a number, has picked a number um, as one guiding point, And that's about seven new cases per 100,000 per day. That's, that's a reasonably low level of transmission. Massachusetts is about three and a half. So it comes in underneath that. There are only about 10 states in the country that are at that level or below. Now you don't wanna make it at a state level. You wanna make it at a community level, but it just tells you the difficulty of if you use the California threshold that 40 out of the 50 states are largely on average out of, out of that range. So 
that to me is a, is a huge challenge. And that's what we have to think about is what is the level of risk? Uh, what is the level of community transmission we're willing to deal with? Right, right. And I think part of what even made us think about this conversation is an op-ed you had in, I believe in the Boston Globe which wasn't one extreme or the other. It takes, it's the fact that there are risks on all sides, risks if we send our kids, but also risks if we don't. And it's not simple math. In fact, you know, there's so many things that we have to consider as parents, as educators, as leaders of, of schools. Um, so, you know, what role can the school, schools play? I know this, is, this has been such a feeling of, you know, as a school leader, there's so much I can't control. But what are some of the things that I can think about as a school, given you know, the fact that there isn't this hard and fast guidance? You know, we have over 13,000 school districts that are each having to figure this out by themselves because we don't have one single policy. So what advice do you have for school leaders and for the teachers and educators themselves? Yeah. So there are two or three parts of that. I'm gonna to try to take them apart a little bit. Um, yeah. One is, I do believe that we have had a failure of real national leadership on this issue, that the level of guidance we've gotten from the CDC, from the Department of Education is inadequate. And what I am experiencing now is every mayor, every school superintendent is having to figure out this stuff on their own. And that is incredibly hard because it's hard for those of us who are steeped in public health, <laughs> um, for educators, uh, the idea that every community should figure this out. We should allow flexibility, but we should give much more detailed guidance. Okay, that, that's a, the second point you bring up, Bridget, which I think is incredibly important, is we, all, we talk a lot about kids and kids are obviously fundamental, but it turns out, and I try to remind people, we can't run schools without adults. Right. Um, and so we also have to think about adults. And, and if, so when we talk about transmission risk, for instance, we talk a lot about, well, do kids transmit in the same way? And, and that's a very important part of the question. But we also have to think about the fact there'll be adults, teachers, other staff, and, and, and that has to factor in. Let me but get at the heart of your question, though, which is what can schools do? And the, and the short answer is they can do a lot. Um, so when I look at Massachusetts and I say, okay, they meet that initial threshold, if the schools of Massachusetts don't do anything special, they try to act like this is a normal fall, they will fail. Um, so there are things I think schools can do. I think, first of all, um, we need to get kids to wear masks in school. That's a challenge, but I think most kids can probably do it. Um, second is we've got to build in that's, that distancing. I think the issues around uh, distancing are important, but they're not like, I, I, don't, I don't obsess a, a incredible amounts about it because I think about my third grader, who's my youngest, he's gonna be a third grader this fall. You know, he will end up interacting with kids. He will end up kind of getting very close. I don't think that we can keep him six feet apart from everybody else. There are really critical issues of, of air ventilation. So most school buildings, or many of them are old, they don't have great ventilation. I, I've been talking about this for, for two months now, and it's getting pretty tight on time, that schools should have in May and June started working on improving ventilation, airflow. That I think makes an enormous difference. Last thing is, I, this is gonna sound a little crazy and I hope it doesn't, but like I would really have loved for us to explore like maybe in September and October, can we do classes outside? Mm -hmm. What we know is that classes outside would be dramatically safer. I understand that that would be harder and we couldn't do it everywhere and we'd have days where we couldn't do it at all. But any amount of outdoor gatherings are so much safer than indoors that to the extent that we can, maybe in the Northeast, we can do it in, in, in September, October, maybe in the South, we can do it in November, December. But it's, it's, a, it's a strategy that says, let's do all of these things. Right. All of them maximize our chances right. of getting through this. Yeah, no, I definitely am feeling, you know, as I have run the ed school and talked to lots of other um, school leaders, you're really dealing with a lot of imperfect solutions. And if you take it all or nothing, then you, you, you end up, you know, with no possibilities. But if we can use possibility uh, of being outside for at least some part of the year, if we can think outside and use the cafeterias, I know this has been an idea, cafeterias, um, other halls, public libraries, thinking creatively, which means you know schools will need partners. They will need help. They will need proactive help um, for those who are in the community to help them come up with solutions in, in terms of space. Um, exactly. So yes, all of all of those pieces are important, but we have to be nimble, constantly nimble. And I think that's some of what makes this so difficult. It would be wonderful if we just picked one scenario and that's the way we went forward. But how do we grapple with this constantly evolving landscape? Um, so for example, you mentioned, you know, every mayor, every superintendent is trying to figure this out, but also parents. Um, it's interesting seeing how public 
has had to become basically mad, mini statisticians. Um, you know, I remember March and April every day, my husband keeping on a little post-it note, the number of new cases in Massachusetts and trying to make sense of this data. So can you give us some guidance? I mean, what should we be focusing on? Which numbers, the, the percent, you know, who test positive, the number of cases, the number of deaths, the capacity of, of hospitals, with so much flying around, it's, it's just hard to know what should we be getting excited about uh, versus what can we somewhat ignore? Yeah, great question. So let me say two things. Um, first of all, if you just want to talk about the numbers, there are two numbers that I want you, I want everybody to follow. And you can find them on, so we, we have a website, globalepidemics.org. Um, it's a partnership of a whole bunch of public health, academic, and, and, and think tank organizations. We've put together for every county what your new cases are. And what I want you to focus on is new cases per 100,000 per day. Per 100,000 just kind of standardizes it across the population. So we can talk about different counties with different populations. And then the second is percent positive in the state. Ideally, locally, but a local percent positive is hard. Here's the way to think about percent positive. Percent positive is a way of saying, like, how many cases are you missing? Once you start getting percent positive, sort of seven, eight, nine percent of your tests are coming back positive, you're missing a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. And so whatever your case number is, is too low. And it's actually probably much higher than that. And so California set up the thing of seven cases per 100,000 per day or um, three per 100,000 per day and a percent positive greater than eight. There are lots of other numbers you can look at, deaths and hospitalizations. I would largely say, unless you really want to get into the details of the modeling, focus on new cases per day and percent of your tests that are positive. And that'll give you a pretty good feel. Um, the second point I just want to throw out is, you know, there are trade-offs here. And what I've been saying to policymakers, and I think all the parents and educational leaders have to do is, if you have bars open in your state right now, you probably won't be able to have schools open in the fall. Um, and that, that's just a choice. And my personal values are close the bars so we have a shot at keeping schools open, but your, your values may differ. But I think most Americans probably would come down there. So we have to also articulate to our uh, political leaders that if the number of cases are rising, if you still have bars and indoor dining and gyms open, you're doing it wrong. You're not setting up your schools for success. Right, right. Yeah, this has certainly been, it's interesting to see because this is where the rubber hits the road. What do you value? What are we putting as a priority? And now we realize, and I think a number of states have realized, you may have messed this up. If we really are focused on our schools, if we're really focused on our students, we might be making very different decisions about who you know we're trying to protect and how we're, we're pushing this forward. Um, I wanna talk a little bit more about that. Like how do we engage as communities um, on, you know, concerning these trade-offs, because this is really balancing lots of different risks. Take, for example, communities of color have been hit so hard, Black, Latino, Native American communities, um, where uh, the rate of, of illness and death has been um, much higher. Um, but many of these communities are the exact same communities where education is just so crucial. Um, and with the direct disruptions that we've already had, we're getting very concerned that existing achievement gaps are just getting worse. So, yep. you know, how do we balance? What do we need to do as a society, as communities? Um, because the schools are not going to be able to do that by themselves. They're not going to be able to take on, um, you know, that challenge by themselves. Yeah. No, this is this is one where um, I don't know. I, have, I vacillate between like being frustrated and angry and and sad and and all of those things. I have lots of emotions around this topic. Um, we, so from a health point of view, this, this virus has uh, had very disproportionate effects on minority populations that you mentioned. Um, we do know, I mean, I think about my kids uh, in Newton public schools. Uh, I think it clearly being in school will be much, much better for them. But, but I think they're gonna manage better than a lot of kids of parents who don't have the same resources, don't have the same access uh, to technology for whom not being able to work is going to be incredibly difficult. Like they're just advantages that, that I have as a parent that lots of parents don't. And so it becomes that much more critical. And then when you do surveys, you find that uh, people of color are actually more hesitant about sending kids back to school because they know what the experience of mismanaging this pandemic has been in a way that's very sharp. So all of that is a way to say that there is an urgent need to act 
uh, especially in those communities. And that means, uh, in my mind, and I'm very clear on this, suppressing the virus, really being aggressive in those communities, saying absolutely no gyms, no bars, no indoor dining, uh, no indoor gatherings of any meaningful type, uh, even if your virus levels are low. Like, let's make schools as safe as possible uh, because it's so important that we open them up and we keep them open and we keep the kids and teachers and others safe. I think it is doable, but it requires a level of political leadership that has not been very present in lots of parts of our country. And that's the part that really upsets me. Yes, that's, that's the unfortunate part. Um, another uh, special community that we know is really affected when we jump to remote are just young kids. You know, the differences, you know, you have what, eight to 15 year olds, my kids are 10 and 12. In some ways, incredibly lucky that they can sit in front of a screen, work independently. But, you know, I certainly know with uh, friends, staff members, who have smaller kids, it was a lot more difficult. Um, and so there's been some movement to really prioritize our elementary schools, that if we can't do all of K through 12, let's really focus on the youngest kids. You know, how do you think about that? And there seems like there's a lot of debate, um, and you mentioned this briefly before, a lot of debate about do small kids transmit or not? How might it impact or what are the risks to their teachers? Um, do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah. So you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with a pretty strong statement basically saying we got to get kids back to school. And if you read through it, um, I think there's pretty broad consensus among most of us that um, we have to prioritize K through five, uh, that those, you know, some people say K through four, K through six. I think that we, we can discuss, but let's say K through five, because that's what the National Academy of Medicine also um, uh, did the cutoff. And, and there are a couple of reasons. I, and again, you understand the educational benefits much better than I do. But I have personally seen it as well. I have an eight-year-old and I have 13 and 15-year-olds. The 13 and 15-year-olds have not, like they've struggled, but they've mostly managed. The eight-year-old has really struggled in, in a virtual, just he really just, it's not his thing. Um, and that's just one anecdote of a broader set of stories that we do know about younger kids. So I have said, and I've advocated to school superintendents and, and others, that we should try to get younger kids back in a bit and have a different threshold. Um, if you have out of control outbreaks, if you're in Miami-Dade, if you're in Houston, Dallas, you just can't do it. And if those communities prioritize, if they really cared about getting kids back to school, they would uh, numbers low enough, but that would be a sacrifice. In my opinion, a sacrifice worth making for our kids, but that's a value judgment. Um, but I do think we should have a lower threshold. But one quick thing is that there's reasonably good data that young kids transmit less. That should make it safer, still have adults to deal with. You still, but I think if we do all the other things, just a lower threshold for young kids. Okay, that's, that's great. Um, so I think, you know, I'm gonna go to the questions that are being submitted by the audience in just, just a minute. Um, and ahead of time, we reached out to some of our alumni at HGSC who are leading school districts uh, around the country and around the world. Um, got a wonderful question um, from one of our alums who's working in the Denver Public Schools. Um, and, and she writes, you know, there are many, many stakeholders and voices that matter. We've kind of been talking around those themes and about what values are going to rule. Um, and as school leaders, you know, how do you balance listening to all of these different voices when you're trying to make these really impactful situations? Um, you have parents all along the spectrum and how they feel about this, teachers, their own personal safety um, and concerns. Um, communities and so forth. So how do you balance all of these different voices, you know, that are also dealing with really complex information that's sometimes constantly evolving and hard to understand? Yeah, I was gonna say, Dean Long, I, have, I would like to ask you that question <laughs> of how do you balance this as a, as a leader? I mean, I can tell you from just quickly, but I would actually love it if, if you had thoughts on this. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that we, we've taken these conversations and made them sort of this very simplistic, like, do you wanna get kids back to school or not? Or let's get them back because kids don't transmit as much. And I have tried at least as best as I can to say like, this is a very complex ecosystem here. And we do have adults and we do care about them. And we care about them as people. We care about them like they're fun. Like if teachers start getting sick, first that's awful unto itself. Second, you, the school's gonna get shut down. Like they're just, we can't have these very, narrowly defined conversations like do kids transmit or not. It is much more complicated. Um, there are these big spill on effects on parents. Parents feel anxious about sending kids back to school. It's true that kids generally don't 
uh, get as sick, but some kids do get sick. Right. And so like, we can't also just totally blow that off. Um, so my take in general has been, we have to have these open conversations. We have to understand the costs of keeping kids at home as well. And then we have to put our best effort forward and give it a shot in places where it's reasonable to try. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, addressing, trying to address that question, you know, a lot of my more work more generally is just how do we deal with information overload? Whether that's how do I be a good parent to what educational investments matter to how do I go to college? And so um, as we're looking at the Q&A, there's a lot of questions that we're getting where people are just trying to get a sense of who can I trust? Who are the trusted resources? And so even, you know, my earlier question about which indicators matter and which ones don't, because there's just a, so much that's going on. So what would you recommend? Who can they trust when they are looking at these evolving situations? Yeah, so um, it's difficult because and I'm just gonna be, I'm speak very frankly here, like in any other pandemic, any other outbreak, I would have said CDC is your like go-to and CDC remains a go-to like, but this is hard. There are reports that come out of the CDC, which I can read and say, wow, this is really done by the scientists there and it's fabulous because the great scientists of the CDC are still there. And then there are other reports that come out of the CDC that now, and this never has happened before in any outbreak that I've ever seen, where you can see it as a pure political statement and not based on science. And that I think really has hurt the credibility of CDC and that's uh, very upsetting. I, I think there are national public health leaders. I mean, Tony Fauci, there is nobody more credible, um, but, you know, but it's gonna be hard to get per personal consultation from Tony about your personal school district um, so I do think you need to look at your state public health leaders. Uh, I think that we have to get people focused on the key metrics that matter. I'm tracking dozens of metrics of every state and you don't need to do that. There are a few key things you need to look at and, uh, and trust you know, local public health leaders who I still think are trying to do a really good job. But they're also struggling because they're also overwhelmed. The one thing I will say is people who give you simplistic answers are the one group you should not trust. Mm -hmm. There are not simple answers here. So people who say, just open it up. No, like that, that's irresponsible. Or people say, there's no way you can ever open. No, that's also not right. These are nuanced, subtle decisions. Uh, they require trade-offs. Um, and I just think you've got to help. And obviously, you know, turning to public health folks like me, others who are also trying to guide uh, people with, with these right. difficult decisions. Yeah, I think that's really important guidance. And again, keeping track of what's going on in your local community. And then I think a lot of it is, you know, as a parent, how can you support and help the schools? The schools, I mean, are grappling with so much still from spring and summer and quickly trying to make um, plans. I did see this uh, really great quote from a student saying, the changes are happening faster than, you know, schools can actually make plans, which I, I think is right. So this is constantly evolving. But if we can keep an eye on what's happening in community um, and try to work with our schools and play to the assets as best we can, um, which brings us to another question. There are a lot of questions just about masks. Are masks good enough in terms of safe, a safety precaution if you're in a community with fairly low rates? Um, schools are doing the best they can with distancing. But like you said, you know, your eight-year-old is, is not going to stay six feet away from his, his, his close buds. Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you the official answer to how to think about this, and I'll tell you what I really personally think is where the evidence probably is. So the right, the kind of official, and I'm not official, I'm not an official anything, I'm just, but the kind of the right, the standard answer of public health folks is um, that we have to do all of these things. Mass really matter and distancing really matters and kind of disinfecting and social, you know, and deep cleaning of schools really matters and uh, ventilation matters. I'll tell you what I think is most important. I think there's been a little bit of a distraction around all the like deep cleaning and, and disinfectant. I am unconvinced that fomite surfaces are a major source of infection. So I'm also not completely convinced that six feet is so critical uh, in schools all the time. I'm not suggesting we all gather together in a tight assembly hall. Like we've got to maintain some amount of social distancing. But since nobody can do everything all day, if I had priorities, I would put priorities on ventilation of the building. So if you can keep windows open, critical. Any amount of fresh airflow, you gotta keep airflow happening. If you can upgrade your ventilation system, you can put, there are portable ventilation things that are not great, but they can be a little added help. 
though that I would prioritize massively. And second is I would prioritize wearing masks uh, massively. If you can get kids to wear masks all day, uh, look, if they need breaks every couple hours, kids go outside, can take off their masks. I'm fine with that. Whatever you need to do to do it. This is none of this is easy, but masks and ventilation are the two things I would prioritize most. Uh, spacing, I'd prioritize some and cleaning stuff. Like, I'm not saying don't wash your hands, like get kids to wash their hands. But like that to me is not the make or break of what's going to make the difference in the schools. Right. And we've talked mostly about K through 12, but I wonder, do you have any advice for colleges, uh, you know, older kids who understand directions, but maybe don't necessarily follow them? Yeah. Um, already, I was reading an article this morning of a, another um, peer institution where students are pushing back on, you know, the college compact that they're supposed to sign that they're going to follow certain certain community guidance. What advice have you given to to higher ed? Yeah, I've been I've been talking to universities and colleges all across the country, and what I have said to them is, you can get them to sign whatever compact you want. If your entire policy is reliant on nineteen year olds uh, maintaining social distancing all the time, especially when they're not in class, that's a policy designed to fail. So try push them, try to hold them accountable, but understand that certain amount of quote unquote bad behavior is gonna happen. And you've got to build in safety measures. And one of the things we have not talked about with schools, which I, I, I think I, I'm, I've been advocating for schools as well as for higher ed is testing. Yeah. I really do think testing is incredibly important. Um, testing is obviously very strained in our country. I have a piece out in a Time uh, Magazine yesterday in which basically I make the case for cheap, mediocre testing. Uh, it's always hard to argue for mediocre testing, but it's, if we can get cheap, ra you know, rapid, um, even if it's not the highest quality testing, but we do it all the time, mm -hmm. uh, much, much easier to administer in kids than the very kind of much more invasive PCR testing, much cheaper, those technologies exist. If we could make them widespread, it would add a really important layer of protection, particularly important for higher ed, but I also think for uh, secondary and primary schools. So, I really think t testing has not gotten enough attention in this space. Uh, the the kind of key point on this is there is no one thing, right? There is no, it's just adding layers of protection. And the more layers of protection we can add in, the better the chances that we can keep people safe and, and keep schools open longer. Yeah. All of it could fail with one bad outbreak. You can't, you can't guarantee it. But yeah. testing, mask wearing, ventilation, each of them is a layer of protection. Right, absolutely. We're going to have to try those multiple um, approaches. So as we're getting close to the end, I, I do wonder, looking ahead with some optimis optimism, when we're on the other side of this, do we just go back to normal or is there a better than normal that we should be shooting for, really preparing ourselves for right now? On, on education? On education, on thinking about public health, on thinking about even, you know, from my perspective, I would really love for us to walk away from this realizing and underscoring the important, importance and urgency of education. That it's not this side thing, a nice to have, but it's actually critical. Um, it's in a critical industry for um, our society, for moral reasons, emotional reasons, social reasons, economic reasons. You know, that's not one thing I'm hoping we'll walk away with. What, yeah. what about for you? Yeah. No, I, and for me, there are two things. One is certainly understanding the critical role of public health and how if you fail to invest in public health, you have these very large effects throughout your entire society. But to get to the conversation of today, you know, it has been really striking to me that um, we have spent the last few months debating whether to open bars, whether to open restaurants. And it's like, to me, this is not a close call from a priority point of view uh, schools trump pretty much everything else. Uh, and yet we have given it so little intention until now. And what I, one of the things I hope we do walk away is recognizing that intricate link between public health and education, yes. uh, how education really drives public health, how public health helps drive education, that the, the two communities that we live in, the you and I live in, Bridget, that, we, that, that our missions are actually incredibly aligned, right? right? And if you, if the educational mission fails, it's incredibly harmful to public health. And if the public health mission fails, it's incredibly harmful to education. I think if we can come out with that link much more firmly established, I think both of our communities will be much better off. I completely agree. I completely agree. And not to take for granted 
what is absolutely so critical and all the things that education does and our public health system does, certainly being put to the test right now. Yeah. Um, Ashish, I want to say thank you again um, for spending some time with us. Thank you all for, for joining us uh, for this conversation. We're going to continue to take your questions on Facebook. Um, and please do, uh, everyone, stay in touch and check out hdse.me slash ednow to rewatch this episode. And also to find out about next week's episode on Wednesday um, entitled Practicing Anti-Racism in Your School. So take care and stay well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.